All right, what's up, peeps? Ambassador here. And before we go any further with the What's Your Favorite Guitar series and other episodes in the Guitar Architecture series or even the Guitarology, <laughs> Guitarology um, series, it occurred to me that what we might want to do and this, we probably should have started this a few months ago, actually, um, is talk about, one, most importantly, the woods that guitars are made out of, right? Because that's super important. And if I'm explaining to you um, the characteristics of one of my favorite guitars, right? One of the main things I'm gonna be discussing, things like size and shape and style, and of course the woods that all the different parts are made out of. And over the last few weeks, I have to admit, it occurred to me, you know, I went through the phase of studying tone woods, but that doesn't mean that everyone else has, right? Especially, non-players who just love music and want to learn more about guitar. But if you're like me and you're a player and you've been a professional musician for years or decades, you may not know about the woods that guitars are made out of. I got to be honest with you. I have always been less of a player and more of a singer songwriter, right? So my guitar collection, believe it or not, is a lot less about playing than it is about what the guitar sounds and feels like to me in terms of how it inspires me to write songs. That's what it comes down to. Yes, I have heard the question a hundred times, why do you need so many guitars? And the simple answer is, is it's inspiration. It's really, I think for players, for session guys, it's about having access to as many sounds as they need to pull off every conceivable kind of gig they're going to be offered. Whereas, at least for me as a songwriter, it comes down to two things and it's very easy to understand. One is I use a lot of open tunings, right? You get bored with regular tuning pretty early on in your career and you move on to your first open tuning then your second, then your third, then your fourth. So when we play a live show, you'll see that Fernando, our guitarist, who's always to my right, he usually has two guitars on stage, his main guitar and his spare guitar, should he break a string. But behind me, I'll have four, five, six guitars. And that's because each one is tuned to a different open tuning, right? Now, for me, a lot of times, Getting a new guitar, and when I say a new guitar, I mean a new, used, old guitar, really just comes down to what is that guitar going to do for me? How it feels when I'm holding it? How I feel when I'm looking at it, right? It's visual and aesthetic qualities. What's it sound like? Is it a little bit different than other guitars that I have? And thus, is it going to inspire me to continue to write great songs? That's what it comes down to. But does that mean that I ever, ever studied, one, the anatomy of the guitar, right? Like, why is it shaped and styled and built the way it is? No. Or two, what kind of woods go into making a guitar? Got to be honest with you. I never paid attention to that. Um, like a lot of players and uh, singer-songwriters, you know, you're told a guitar is good, you know a guitar is good. Certain guitars have great reputations, right? And so you get it, and that's it. Someone might mention to you, oh, it's got an Engelman spruce top and a mahogany back and sides, and you're like, yeah, cool, that's great. And it just goes in one ear and out the other. So. What I'm going to do, this is just going to be episode one. We're going to do a few episodes. And I want to tell you from the start that we are going to do an episode about 
tone woods, all right? Now, they're called tone woods because they're the woods that we use to make guitars with. But when you Googled this, you probably searched for something like what, what wood is used to make guitars or what, were, what woods are used to make guitars out of. And I think that's a really important question to answer. In the first episode or two, we'll just talk about the basics of that. And then we'll do an episode, once we have that down and it's fresh in our minds, then we'll do an episode where we just pick up different guitars and we can hear what those different woods sound like, all right? In this first episode, I'm just gonna show you a few charts that were very helpful for me. And obviously from here, you can't see them, but in editing, we're gonna slip them in so you can check it out, all right? So check this out. This is the very first chart that I ever looked at when I was interested in guitars and tone woods, okay? This is gonna be a little weird because I'm kind of looking at it with you, but I'm gonna give you a full screen of it while I talk, all right? All this does is it just lists the guitar woods down here, and then here, it just gives you a graphical representation of the frequency response of that wood, meaning how much low end and how much high end is that wood capable of expressing when you strum it, right? Because it's two things. That wood has to respond to that frequency and then that wood has to express it back out, right? So if you look at it, let's start with rosewood, even though that's not top of the list, but rosewood is the wood that when you think of the acoustic guitar, the traditional acoustic guitar, for decades they were made with rosewood, okay? Either, um, either the Brazilian rosewood or the East African rosewood, East Indian rosewood, um, but in other words, in the 60s and 70s, he, everybody had a rosewood guitar. And you would recognize them if you saw the back because it's like those three-piece backs that Martin made famous. Um, rosewood is a great tone wood for guitar, okay? One of the things you're gonna notice about rosewood is that it has a very broad frequency response. In other words, it picks up a lot of the lows it picks up a lot of the highs. And I believe if I take a look at this, yes, they bend the line a little bit because there is, let's say there's a legend out there about Rosewood that it somehow magically has a mid-range scoop. In other words, it's responsive to the mid-range and it will express it sonically, but it scoops it out a little bit so you don't have to do it on the uh, mixing board, all right? Now, from a scientific, botanical viewpoint, I don't know how true that really is. But at the very least, what we see is that rosewood has a very broad frequency range. Now, post-rosewood, right during the war and afterwards, Companies like Gibson and Martin, they couldn't get their hands on rosewood and they wanted to make cheaper guitars. So they started using mahogany. So a lot of those records from the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, what you're hearing is mahogany. And now mahogany has made a comeback. I mean, a lot of guitars are made with mahogany. You, you probably see mahogany now used more than any other wood for the backs and sides of the guitar. And what I'm talking about here are the backs and sides. Let's talk about the top for a second, okay? The top of your guitar is probably made out of some type of spruce. Now, that's become extremely popular now. I mean, every guitar manufacturer, they tout the virtue of their guitar and how incredible it sounds, and they promise you the world because it has a Sitka spruce top. But you know what? So does every other guitar. So it's nothing to brag about. Um, 
spruce, whether it's Sitka spruce or Engelmann spruce, there's a variety of different ones here. Here's a bear claw spruce, Adirondack spruce. There's a variety of different spruce uh, woods, all from the spruce trees that are used for the top. And there's a reason for that, okay? The sound that we get from the woods that we use on the guitar really come down to three things. The density of the grain. How close is the grain, right? And the hardness of the wood, right? Because it's got a hardness factor. And then there's also the number of pores. And you could almost look at that as how porous is that wood? How open and airy is that wood? That's different than the grains or the density of the grains. It's how many pores are in the wood, right? So look at the top of your guitar, often called the soundboard, right? Um, look at that. It has to move. It has to. You're playing it. That piece of wood is then resonating and vibrating, meaning moving according to what you're playing. If it didn't move, you wouldn't hear a thing at all. Um, so it has to move. Now, spruce happens to be pretty dense in terms of the grain and hard enough to be able to bounce back really fast so you hear it. And yet it's loose enough and open enough to move enough to where it actually resonates and vibrates and you can hear it. And that's why spruce is so popular. Another wood that's very popular for the tops of guitars is red cedar. In fact, I personally am in love with red cedar as a top of a guitar. It's more porous, it's less dense, it moves more, it's it's the main top wood used on classical guitars because they're played much quieter. So if you're a strummer or a picker like I am, playing a flat top steel string like I do, what these are, and you use red cedar, you end up with more harmonic overtones, meaning a more orchestral sound and a less clear, dense sound. And some of you, as I know, um, because you talk about Martin and Taylor every day all over the internet, you guys like that clear, bright tone. Other people, they like a, a denser, muddier tone with a lot more harmonic overtones. That tends to be what I look for um, in the sound of a guitar a lot of the times. But again, it depends on the song, right? But I gotta tell you something. The first time that I actually got a chance to play an MIJ, that's the uh, acronym we use for Made in Japan, for the guitars between 66 to 75. Very, very sought after guitars, especially this one right here. That's the Yam Yamaha. FG 180. It's one of those guitars that every guitar player owns. <laughs> they look for it, they search for it, they eventually find one and they buy it. And again, it's that 66, 67 to 72, 73 era you're looking for for the Yamaha FG 180. It is a classic, very sought after. Now, the first time I played it, I think it's open tuned to an open D9. Um, I couldn't believe it. Princess Little Tree walked in and she said, that thing is huge. I said, the guitar, she goes, the sound of it, it sounds like an orchestra. And so I had to begin to research that. Why does a guitar sound like an orchestra? What's going on here? Like what's happening? That's when I learned about harmonic overtones and the fact that you could have a guitar that can bounce back really quick. It hits you fast, it can go all the way to the back of the hall, 
and it doesn't sustain for very long, but it hits quick. That's a harder, denser wood. And then you've got these other woods that are more open and porous and less density of the grain, right? So they're not going to hit as quick and hit the back of the hall. They're going to be more echoey, more sustainy, and they're going to be able to pick up on more harmonic overtones. So it's a gorgeous sound. I will play it for you. But basically, this chart here is just showing you, based on the size, the frequency response from low, mids to highs. So look at mahogany. Look how short mahogany is, meaning it's a beautiful sounding guitar tone to most people because it really captures that mid-range that everybody can hear regardless of your hearing, right? But look at its response to low frequencies. It's not there. Look at its response to high frequencies. It's not there. Now, the other one that does a good job of that is oven coal, okay? And oven coal is a fairly new wood. A lot of manufacturers are getting into oven coal now. It sounds awesome. This uh, Epiphone Excelente, sides and backs, solid oven coal, it sounds fantastic. Does it sound just like rosewood? Look, rosewood, oven coal. No, because there's another factor involved in the sound of a guitar besides just its ability to pick up on highs and lows. Another factor. We haven't talked about it yet. Um, maybe we'll do that in the next episode. But real quick, just to go through it. Okay, so you see Rosewood? Rosewood, even though it has a broad frequency range like Oven Coal, I'll tell you this. Rosewood has that more metallic zing sound that we're very used to hearing. Mahogany has that woody mid-rangey sound that we're also very accustomed to hearing, okay? Now, maple, maple is one of my favorites, but a lot of people don't like maple. But what I like to do is get jumbo guitars that have backs and sides made of maple because maple is very, very dense and it really snaps back fast. I mean, you can hear it. When you hit it, it responds. Now, maple primarily responds and then expresses the high end and not much of the low end at all. But when paired with a jumbo guitar, which has a tendency to sound more bassy, maple is a perfect pairing. And we have an example of that here with, that's the J200, um, and it's backed with maple. At this point, I have jumbos backed with all the different types of wood, um, mainly because I love jumbos. <laughs> and also, I really like hearing the differences. Um, it is true, the jumbo that I have um, that's backed with rosewood does have a metallic zing that sounds so special. The jumbo that I have backed with mahogany is this guild and i already did an episode with that thing you guys heard it that thing sounds there's no words marvelous fabulous fantastic awesome that guitar just sounds freaking amazing pretty much equal to the j200 my friends that are guitar players are gonna say dude it's not a j200 because it's not a gibson it's an epiphone so call it a ej200 or an sj200 and you know what they're right, I should. But regardless, both of them being jumbos are great sounding guitars. But it shows you the difference between maple and between mahogany. This is a much richer, deeper tone because it's mahogany. This has a deep, rich tone, but you hear more of the high end because the sides and backs are maple. You see that? and. The Rosewood Jumbo is over there. You guys can't see it. And that really does have more of a metallic zing to it, less depth and warmth than these two. 
but that's why you have a lot of guitars. Um, okay, check it out. This is Sapel, at least that's what I call it. You can see it's kind of short in terms of its frequency response. I played a few Sapel guitars over the years, and I haven't found one yet that I like. That's the truth. Every time I've picked one up and played it, I'm like, eh, it's okay. But it's not on like it's not on my list of guitars that I want. Um, then you've got Walnut. Now Walnut has a pretty good and broad frequency range. To cut to the chase of the next episode, we're going to be talking about crispness and brightness versus earthy and overtones, right? That's a different aspect. Look at the frequency range as horizontal and look at the bright, tight crispness versus earthy overtones as your vertical, okay? We'll do that in the next episode. Um, walnut tends to have a more earthy, overtone, woody sound to it. The reason they use dots here is because there's a legend that over time, walnut will open up. I mean, first off, you shouldn't be buying a, a new guitar anyway. So if you buy a walnut guitar that's, let's say, 30, 40, 50 years old, hopefully by then it would have opened up. If not, then we need to get rid of that legend, right? Because they have the same legend about Koa, too. Look at Koa here. Koa is mid-range and high-end. But Koa is such a beautiful sounding tone wood. You guys, if you haven't seen it yet, some of you probably have. That's the Alvarez Yari Artist Edition, 100% Koa. Top, sides, and back. I did an episode with it or two, played a couple of tunes on it, instrumental, so you could really hear it. That sound, it's truly a work of art. Um, Koa is one of those woods that's only found in one place, Hawaii, and that's it. You got to go to Hawaii to find it. So it's not endangered, but it's a very protected wood now. So it's usually expensive. Taylor also does um, a good guitar out of Koa. And you know what? Taylor added Ovencoll this year with the American Dream series. And uh, a buddy of mine has it, and it sounds good. Does it sound as good as the Excelente? I don't know. I'm partial to the Excelente. I think it sounds fantastic. Next up, you've got Coco Bolo. Now, Coco Bolo has a very broad frequency range, and it is a tight, dense wood. Supposedly sounds very dark and murky. I can't wait to own a Coco Bolo backed guitar. I do not own one yet. If you search for them, the cheapest one you'll see, like the cheapos are like $3,600. So it's an investment that you're going to make, you know, but supposedly they sound absolutely fabulous. And then of course there's the ebony and you can see here ebony has a pretty tight frequency range, very similar to mahogany. Doesn't cover all the lows, doesn't cover all the highs, but really covers the mid-range. And that's because that's also a hardwood, usually reserved for fretboards, and very tightly dense grain. From what I've heard, though, from a lot of people, and I don't believe I've got an ebony-backed guitar yet, what I've heard from people is that it has a tight, responsive sound, but it's also dark and offers you some really dark overtones. So, yes, I'm on the hunt for an ebony-backed guitar. Um, so, look, let's stop here. What we've covered is the frequency range of the different woods, right? In other words, how much of the low end, how much of the high end can you hear with the different tone woods used? And also, we've covered the most popular tone woods used on the back and the sides. Again, 
for the top, you're usually talking about either a type of spruce or a red cedar or occasionally cherry. And that's about it. And there's reasons for that and I explained it earlier. All right. Next up, what we'll talk about is bright and crisp versus earthy and woody with a lot of harmonic overtones and how we get there with the different types of wood. All right. But that'll be in the next one. Hey, as always, thanks for watching.